Last summer, I tried Tinder for the first time. I still didn't feel comfortable using an app to hook up with strangers, but all my friends swore by it. My sister Sophie even found her fiancé through Tinder. I wasn't looking for a fiancé, of course. I just wanted to meet someone and have a nice, regular one-night stand. I found a pretty handsome blonde guy who didn't live too far. His name was Adam, and he liked my photo. That's pretty much all I needed to know. I went over to his apartment, and we had a pretty okay time. Afterwards, he went to take a shower, and I left without saying goodbye. I got the feeling that he wanted me to stay over for the rest of the night, but I was not interested. The next day, he called me at work to ask why I left without telling him. I had no idea how he got my number. We never exchanged personal information, and besides, it definitely crossed a boundary. I told him to stay away from me and hung up. That evening when I was leaving work, I saw him standing at the edge of the parking lot. At first, I couldn't tell if it was him. He just stood there in the dark. But once I got in my car and drove off, I could see his face, and it was definitely Adam. When I got home, I told all my neighbors to be on the lookout for a tall, blonde man who might try to sneak around my house. I considered calling the police, but I've heard horror stories about the people with stalkers, and the police usually don't help much. For the next week, I was really on edge. Aside from some muddy footprints right outside my bedroom window, there was no sign of Adam. I knew he was still out there, but I never caught a glimpse of him. My friends came over one night, and they all told me that I was acting jumpy. They were worried about me. My best friend Trevor said I needed to start going out again. I needed to stop thinking about Adam. I said I wasn't ready, but he grabbed my phone off the end table and opened it up to Tinder. I'm going to find you someone to get your mind off of Adam. I tried to wrestle my phone out of his hand, but he kept scrolling through potential hookups. Then he stopped and handed me back the phone. What about this guy? I was looking at one of the hottest profile pictures I'd ever seen. Greg. This guy was gorgeous, and all his information seemed tailor-made for my interests. He was like the perfect guy. I figured that my friends were right. I needed to get on with my life. So an hour later, I found myself outside his address. It was a cozy little house in an upscale neighborhood. I knocked on the door forcing myself to stop being nervous as I waited for Greg to answer. But Greg didn't answer. Adam did. He grabbed me, pulled me into the house, and slammed the door shut behind me. When it was just the two of us in the house, he pulled out a knife. Hi, I'm Greg. <laughs> What's wrong with you? I asked. Nothing, he explained making sure he stood between me and the door. I just like to have a good time. I meet women for a fun night at my place, and when we're done, I love to collect. But when you ran off like you did, I was devastated. I never got to the best part. So you, you decided to try again? And what's the best part? I asked. You made up a fake profile and you... And what? You rented a house? Some people own multiple properties, he said. Don't worry about it. I could tell that there was something he wasn't telling me. I glanced around the living room and saw photos on the wall. They showed a happy family, a husband, wife, and two young boys. Adam, or Greg, or whoever, was the father. That meant this was his house and he had a family. I used that information to my advantage. But what if your wife comes home? I asked. Don't worry, he said. We have plenty of time for ourselves. And then he lunged at me, moved so fast I couldn't dodge to the side. He tackled me to the floor and pinned me down. And then he tied me up to a chair. I will collect now, Adam roared. He casually walked over to a dresser where he pulled out a trimmer. What was he going to do? With cold precision, Adam began to trim my hair. The pain and terror were unbearable, 
as I couldn't help but weak. He gathered my tears in a jar, his satisfaction growing with every drop. As the jar filled, I felt a sinking realization that my life was in grave danger. Suddenly, the front door creaked open, and to my relief, his wife entered the house. <laughs> she wore a sinister smile that sent shivers down my spine. I soon learned that she was just as deranged as her husband, if not more. The sight of me tied to the chair seemed to amuse her, and she wasted no time in joining the twisted ritual. With a wicked grin, she took the trimmer from Adam's hand and approached me. I begged for mercy, but it was as if I had entered a realm of madness where compassion held no place. The wife began to trim my hair with cruel delight, matching her husband's unsettling composure. I cried in agony, but my pleas fell on deaf ears. In a sickening display of sadism, they both collected my tears in separate jars, competing as if it were some twisted game. The pain, fear, and humiliation were overwhelming, pushing me to the brink of collapse. It was a living nightmare I couldn't wake up from. We got what we wanted. We should leave now, Adam said. They left me tied to the chair. As the hours ticked by, my horror only deepened, knowing there was no rescue in sight. After five hours, I somehow managed to untie myself and escape. It was raining outside, but my eyes were completely dry. It's been two months since that horrifying encounter. I know that forever will send shivers down my spine. I can't help but remember the whole ordeal whenever I cry. Tell me, my friends, should I seek therapy? Should I go to the cops? What should I do? When I signed up for the Tinder app, after copious amounts of persuasion from my friends, I hadn't expected to get a match within the first week. There had been a couple of duds that I had immediately swiped left on, but this one had caught my eye. His profile was fun, and we shared a few interests in movies and books, and the picture showed a cute guy taking a selfie with his cat. I was always a sucker for animal lovers, and from his profile alone, he ticked all the right boxes. His name was James, and he was only a year older than me, so when he swiped right on me, I swiped right back. We started talking the same day. I was a little tentative at first, since it was my first time using a dating app, and I wanted to make sure there were no red flags. But he was perfect. Accommodating, curious, friendly. He showed genuine interest in what I talked about, and it felt like we really connected. When I found out he lived in the same city, it felt like fate. We decided to hold off meeting for the moment, but we spoke almost every day. When I woke up, there was always a message waiting for me, saying some things like, good morning, or I woke up thinking about you. I never met someone who made me feel special like that. Of course, I wasn't completely gullible. Part of me knew from previous experience that it seemed too good to be true. But when I asked him for pictures to prove he was real, he complied easily, sending me snaps of him and his cat in the moments. It was real. He was real. And I thought I'd found my match. The next step was a phone call. I decided I would know for sure if I could hear his voice, hear a real person talking to me, not just a text message. He agreed, and we decided to call at 7 o'clock the next evening. I was shaking with nervous excitement the whole day, and even my coworker and best friend Laura could feel it. Whoa, what's with you? She asked, once the coffee shop had quieted down after the lunchtime rush. You look like you're on top of the world. You remember that guy I've been talking to? I said, drumming my fingers against the counter. I could barely stay still. I'm calling him tonight. Laura grinned. That's great. I nodded. I know we're taking things a little slow, but I want to make sure I'm not getting involved with someone, you know, dodgy. I said with a small laugh. Have you seen pictures of him? Laura asked, her eyes narrowed slightly. I made sure the cafe was empty before pulling out my phone and bringing up a gallery of all the photos. Yep, he sends them as soon as I ask, so I know they're real. I know he's real. Laura's eyes lit up. Show me, show me, she said, leaning her head against my shoulder and looking down at my phone. Aw, he's cute, and he has a cat. 
I know, and he's so lovely. I really think I found a decent guy. And you know how difficult those are to find these days, I said, rolling my eyes. Laura said nothing. She was still looking at the photos, a small frown between her brows. You know, something about him seems kind of familiar, she said, her voice pensive. I feel like I've seen him before. I glanced up in surprise. Really? I mean, he does live in the city. Maybe he actually lives pretty close. I looked around the cafe as though expecting him to suddenly appear, but the place was still empty. Yeah, maybe, Laura said, shrugging. I'm happy for you though, Em. I really am. I grinned and put my phone away as the bell above the door jingled and a new customer came in, and I tried to distract my mind for the rest of the day. By the time 7 o'clock rolled around, I was antsy and excited, waiting for James to call. I'd spent the whole day imagining what his voice might sound like and what we would talk about. I never had good experiences with dating in the past, so there was still a shiver of apprehension that something would go wrong. But for the most part, I was certain that James seemed like a great guy. My phone rang with an unknown number dead on 7pm. My fingers were trembling as I picked it up and accepted the call. Hello? I said, my heart fluttering. Emma? The voice was unexpected. That's the only way I could describe it. It sounded like it belonged to a young man, but at the same time, there was a strange breathless quality to it. Like it was coming from far away. I heard a soft crackle and the phone line disconnecting, and then someone breathing raggedly. Uh, James, are you there? Yeah, sorry. He said, his voice cutting. I'm in a place with bad reception. Oh, don't worry. You can call back later if now isn't a good time. It's fine. He said, his voice almost a whisper. I couldn't help but frown. This isn't quite what I'd been expecting, and it was starting to sow doubt in my mind that maybe James wasn't the perfect guy I thought he was. It's really nice to hear your voice, Emma. He continued, his voice the same static rasp. Yeah, you too, I said uncertainly. Was I really talking to James? Hey, how about we call another time? I'm feeling a little tired after work. If you want... He said concomitantly, and after a short back and forth, we decided to hang up and try again another time. When I finally ended the call, I fell back against my bed with a sigh. That hadn't gone the way I'd expected at all, but I didn't want to give up on him completely just because of a phone call. Maybe he really was just in a place with poor reception. We kept talking for a few more days. James apologized for messing up the call and sent me an adorable picture of him with his cat, who I learned was called Misty to make up for it and then we decided to meet up. I felt a little weird bypassing the video call stage, but he seemed eager to meet, and despite the phone call, I was also excited. We planned to meet outside an internet cafe in the middle of the city. I had to take a bus there, and when I told Laura where I was going and who I was meeting, she insisted on coming with me just in case he wasn't who he said he was. She camped out in the internet cafe while I waited for the post box outside, where we had designated the meeting points. I waited there for a good 40 minutes before I realized he had stood me up. That's when I knew that James, the embodiment of my ideal guy, wasn't real. Only it was so much worse than I thought. I headed inside the cafe where Laura was waiting for me and saw her face take on an ashen tinge as she stared at one of the computer monitors, her fingers scrolling down the mouse. He didn't show up, I said, making her jump. She looked up at me. A strange look on her face. M? She said slowly, turning the monitor around so that I could take a look. Is this the guy you've been talking to? On the screen was a photo of James, a few years younger than he seemed now. I frowned. Yeah, that's him. Where did you find this? I heard her swallow audibly as she clicked off the image, taking me to the article where it had been posted. James Ashton, she read out. Dies tragically after meeting with a psycho girl on dating app. I felt my blood rush out of my cheeks, the ground feeling unsteady beneath my feet. Wait, he... he's dead? Laura nodded, her voice wobbling. Yeah, and he has been the whole time you've been talking to him. As I tried to process the shocking revelation about James, I found myself unable to let go of the mystery. The feeling of being ghosted by a deceased person haunted me for days. 
I had to know the truth. As I dug deeper into James's background, I discovered a series of disturbing coincidences. Every person who had interacted with James on the dating app had a bizarre encounter, and all of them shared a peculiar connection. They either experienced severe misfortune or met their untimely deaths. I was now convinced that there's something unnatural at play, something sinister tied to James's virtual presence. With Laura's help, I delved even further into the matter, only to stumble upon an old, ominous urban legend that mentioned a malevolent spirit called the Digital Spectre. According to the legend, this vengeful entity preyed on the living by posing as deceased individuals on various digital platforms, seeking to bring harm to anyone who engaged with it. I realized that James was nothing but a malevolent ghost, manipulating tech to lure and harm unsuspecting users. A wave of terror washed over me, but the thought that I had narrowly escaped becoming another victim gave me some composure. But my horror didn't end here. Over the next few days, strange glitches occurred on my laptop and phone. I received cryptic messages from unknown sources, and my mental health started to go south. As days passed, my grip on reality started to crumble. I could hardly leave the safety of my home. With the unnatural power involved, how could I trust anybody? Lines between the real world and the digital realm blurred for me completely. I'd stopped eating and drinking. With each passing day, I was slowly losing it. I was hooked to my phone 24-7. Something dark and unknown was pulling me towards it. Emma! Emma, what happened to you? Oh my god! It's been two months since I was rescued. Laura has burned both my phone and laptop. I'm slowly recovering, but my therapist says it will take a long time for me to be my former self. I guess I would be better off social media forever. Daniel was nice. Ah, oh, who am I kidding? Daniel was great. Pale green eyes and dark brown hair. Perfectly chiseled body. Oof. After three weeks of letdowns, I could tell Daniel was going to be one of the better ones. From the get-go, he had the hotel booked and ready. How sweet of him. I love these straight-to-the-point guys. The ones that don't beat around the bush and expect any of that relationship bullshit. Who has time anyway these days? I met Daniel on Tinder just a few hours ago. After scrolling all evening without encountering anyone remotely interesting, his profile caught my eye. Bit of a last minute arrangement if you ask me, but you know what they say, spur of the moment decisions are some of the best ones. Ah, uh, sorry about that, he said, stopping me, breaking my reverie. His phone was ringing and I saw its screen show an unknown caller ID. Great. Do you mind if I pick up? Could be someone from work. He politely asked. Yeah, of course. Not like I'm going anywhere tonight. I said with a wink. A small incentive so he'd remember to finish the call quickly. Daniel gave me a nice sexy smirk in return and picked up the phone. Hello? He looked confused. Who's this? I think you have the wrong person here. He was pacing around the room, then with a worried look plastered across his face, I could faintly hear a woman's voice on the other end of the line. A secret lover? God, maybe he's got a whole other identity and is married with kids. That wouldn't be a first. You can never tell with these guys you meet online. Yes, I'm Daniel Walton, but I'm telling you, I haven't taken a loan, much less one of that sum. You have the wrong number. He sat down on the edge of the bed now. I raised an eyebrow and mouthed, Is everything okay? He nodded, but I could tell things weren't exactly what you would call okay. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door. Pale. I'm telling you, I don't know anything about a debt. It's not mine. You're the wrong guy. Leave me alone or I swear I'll... He screamed into the phone and immediately got hung up on. Now I was getting worried. Did I misjudge him? What sort of illegal thing is this guy into? Daniel looked at me in the eye and said, Look, Julia, that was some crazy lady rambling about debts that I need to pay tonight. She said that if I didn't do it willingly, one way or another, her men will make sure that I do. So I think we're going to have to make a run for it. What? 
I asked, confused about the whole thing. I have no idea what debt she's- Daniel Walton, open up! Shouted a man on the other side of the door. Damn it, that has to be them now! Well, what do we do? I asked him again. Daniel looked around the room and locked his eyes at the window. We were on the sixth floor, but there was a fire escape outside. The men kept banging on the door. He didn't have to explain. He quickly crossed the room and tried to open them. No go. They were bolted shut. We could hear the men working on the locks, trying to break in. I looked around and saw a particularly heavy desk light and tossed it over to Daniel. He swiftly caught it and threw it out the window, breaking the glass in the process. Freeze! Too late. The men had broken through the door. They held Daniel and me at gunpoint. There were two of them, wearing cheap black and white suits. One of them began talking. Daniel Walton, I trust that madam has explained your circumstances. We require your outstanding debt of $500,000 paid in full tonight. We both had our hands up. Daniel looked like a deer in the headlights. I... He stuttered. I don't remember anything about such a debt. It's not mine. You've got the wrong guy. Please. They slowly moved towards him, holding him at gunpoint. Daniel was getting desperate. Please. He begged them. The same man spoke again. Sir, you have to understand that if you're unable to pay us in full tonight, we're at the liberty to take any one of your organs to cover the outstanding amount. Daniel looked at me. He thought of something. They don't have to be mine, right? Locking eyes with me, he asked them, The organs, they don't have to be mine. My sigh. It always came down to this. I thought at least cute little Daniel Walton here would hold up for a few hours, but no. He's weak like everyone else. Alright boys, that's enough. Wrap him up. Daniel's eyes went wide. He was about to face the men when the bullet hit him square on the forehead. The other guy had fired his gun. The noise contained by a silencer on its muzzle. Wasn't a bad kill at all. On point, exactly what we needed. Remind me to recommend you to my uncle, okay? I whispered into his ears while he knelt over Daniel's dead body. Yes, ma'am. He replied as he helped carry Daniel's body to the bathroom. Oh, and Malta said she would like a word with you, ma'am. Of course she does. I rolled my eyes and threw myself on the bed. That was a complete bummer. He didn't even last five minutes. Daniel's phone rang again. The men handed it to me and sure enough, Malta was on the other end. Calling to revel in my misery, is it? I asked as I turned to look at the ceiling. Oh, come on, did you really look at the profile we compiled on that guy and think he would last more than five minutes? Money laundering, aiding, and abetting human trafficking? You can't be serious, right Talon? Oh, I don't know, Malta. Maybe I'm just getting old and soft. Well, either way, you lost the bet, so family dinner's on you tonight. I sighed. All right, all right. What do you want? I could hear clicking a pen. You remember that place at the corner of Chinatown, near the butchers? Hmm, not sure. Is it above our old speed lab from all those years ago? Yeah, that one. Dad loved that pecking duck place, no? We should get him something nice tonight. You know, with all the trouble he's going through with the synthetic substance guys. Of course. Anything for you and the family, Malta. Ta-da! Brad pulled his hands away from my eyes and I got my first view of the place. Wow! I said, careful to make sure my voice sounded enthusiastic. I didn't want my husband to hear any of the disappointment I was feeling. The place was big, as he's told me, but it was also run down and filthy. The paint was peeling and half of the shutters had fallen off. The whole place looked sad, broken. This was not where I wanted to spend the rest of my life. I knew Brad had called it a fixer-upper, but that was an understatement. This place should be bulldozed. So you like it? He asked. I love it. I knew how he wanted me to react and I knew how much this moment meant to him. Together we walked over the dead grass, up the broken porch steps, and into a house that genuinely made me want to recoil. The inside was just as bad as the outside, with missing tiles on the floor and a musty acrid smell throughout, as if something had died in the walls. This was our new house but the only thing new about it were the flies that had come in with us. 
and that was how Brad and I moved into the house on Cherry Street. We unpacked our boxes the same day, and Brad went to work the day after, leaving me alone with the dust and frustration. For the first week, I spent nearly all of my waking hours cleaning off surfaces and making a list of everything that needed to be replaced. I woke up, got to work, and then ended my day with a lukewarm shower in brownish water. Every day, Brad would come home from the office stressed from his new job and ask me how my day went. I always bottled up my sadness and told him that I was just fine, that I loved the house he'd picked for us. The days were terrible, but the nights were even worse. After the sun dipped over the mountains behind us, the house began to make noises, creaks and groans and all sorts of unidentifiable sounds that Brad euphemistically called settling. The house was settling. We were too. On those long nights while Brad snored away, I lay in bed and tried to ignore the noises around me. I took Ambien, more than I should have, and that worked for a while, but after about a week I couldn't sleep at all. The noises were getting worse. They were changing too. What started out as minor creaks and groans morphed into louder noises, banging, thugs, worst of all, whispering. At first I thought it was all in my sleep-deprived head, but I knew I wasn't crazy. There was actual whispering coming from the walls, <laughs> unintelligible voices that were sometimes punctuated by giggles. <laughs> Several times I woke up Brad from his deep sleep, but as soon as I did, the whispering stopped. It was as if the house wanted to terrorize me and me alone. Each time he got increasingly annoyed as if I was finding unnecessary flaws with his perfect home. After a few nights of this, I gave up completely. He'd never hear the voices, and he'd never believe me. After two weeks of sleep deprivation and near constant fear, I'd had enough. The whispering had grown even louder, the voices more confident. I had to figure this out for myself. I pushed myself out of bed, careful not to awaken my husband and elicit even more anger. I crept out of the room and into the long, dark hallway. Aside from the creaking floorboards under my bare feet, I had to be silent. I had to listen to the whispers to see where they were coming from. I passed the bathroom, with its dripping shower nozzle plinking to the rhythm of my heartbeat. I passed the guest bedroom, deathly quiet, and then the living room. When I made it to the kitchen, I knew I'd found the source of the whispering. I was close enough and the voice was loud enough for me to make out individual words. They sad remove the wife. <laughs> These voices were talking about my husband and me. They were laughing too, coldly, mockingly. I pushed open the kitchen door, expecting to find nothing on the other side. After all, these were just voices. They didn't have a physical presence. The kitchen's windows were all covered, so it took a second for my eyes to adjust to the darkness. But when they did, I gasped in horror. There, crouched near the table, were two figures. One was male and the other female. They were bent low, tearing apart a loaf of bread that sat on the floor between them. They noticed me right away. I couldn't see their faces in the dark, but I saw them turn their heads and look at me. I was too scared to move, too scared to flee for my life. The figures didn't move for a long moment, just waiting in the dark until the man whispered something to the woman. The woman whispered back. It was some kind of disagreement between them. Then the man stood up, thin and frail but impossibly tall. He walked towards me, and before my frozen body could react, he grabbed my shoulders and lowered his face until it was inches from mine. This is a nightmare, he whispered. You're asleep and then he pushed me backwards, out of the kitchen. He slammed the door behind him. That was when I screamed. I guess it had taken that long for my senses to come back to me. I screamed louder than I ever had before, and in seconds, Brad ran to me from the bedroom. What's wrong? He asked. I, I couldn't form words. No sounds would leave my mouth. All I could do was point one shaky finger towards the kitchen door. He angrily pushed it open and charged into the kitchen. I wanted to stop him, but I just couldn't. Then he called my name, 
Teresa! Come here now! I held my breath and followed him into the dark room. He clicked on the light and the kitchen was completely empty. By then, my throbbing heartbeat had slowed and I was able to speak. People, I said, there were, there were people in here. He spread his arms out wide and gestured all around him. Yeah, well, they're not here now. Jesus Christ, Teresa, do you hate our new house so much that you have to ruin my sleep with some hallucination? And he was right. There were no intruders there. I looked at the floor where the figures had been crouching. Brad, I said, look at the crumbs. The tiles were speckled with breadcrumbs. So, you must have missed a spot when you were sweeping. Finally, I snapped. I was done being scared. I was done hiding my emotions. I hate this house, Brad! I shouted. It was the first time I had ever shouted at my husband. It's terrible, and there are, there are things here, and I'm tired of you pretending that everything is perfect. It's not, and I want us to move out right now! <laughs> Before Brad could answer, I heard a giggle coming from the half-open pantry. Fear ate away at my anger, and my beating heart was now filled with a mixture of both fear and anger. Brad's expression softened. I realized that he heard it too. Finally, he started walking towards the pantry. D don't, I told him. He ignored me and pulled open the pantry and clicked on the light. I carefully stepped forward, feeling the bits of breadcrumbs under my bare feet. I looked over Brad's shoulder into the pantry, but it was empty. Just shelves of spices and canned food. My heart sank, and then Brad leaned forward and pushed some of the cans to the side, revealing a small opening in the wall behind the shelves. I'd never seen that before, even though it was big enough for a full-grown adult to crawl through. He leaned his face toward the opening and shouted, Whoever you are, get out here now! Inside the darkness, there was some rustling and silence. And slowly... Very slowly, the man and woman crawled into the light. They were covered in dust, their clothes torn and ragged, and they smelled like mold, like filth. I glanced at Brad to make sure he saw what I saw, and he did. He glared at the intruders. Who are you? he asked. The man answered. The bank took everything away, but we couldn't leave. This house is ours. You... You've been living in the walls? I asked. The woman looked away, but the man's dark eyes locked onto me. He stared me down. This is our house, he said again. Brad told me to get my phone and call the police. Then he turned back towards the couple and screamed at them. We bought this fair and square. If you don't leave us alone, we're going to... I interrupted my husband. No, I said. I'm done. I turned and walked straight out of the front door. I got in my car and drove to a hotel. The house on Cherry Street was ours. It was what Brad had chosen for us. But I refused to set foot in it ever again. I'd finally had enough. <laughs>